Okay, I think uh, it's 10 o'clock and it's time to begin. Uh, hello to everyone uh, joining in from both the Cisco uh, WebEx app as well as those uh, seeing it in, on YouTube. And welcome to the fourth edition of the SciTech uh, Spins lecture series organized by the Indian Institute of uh, Technology, Delhi. So this lecture series is uh, newly initiated by the Institute and it offers a, a, an opportunity to both the professor as well as the students. The students uh, 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 gain uh, an insight into the latest uh, developments as well as the ideas that are being pursued in both uh, science and engineering. On the other hand, the professor gets to interact uh, mm -hmm. with the scientists of uh, tomorrow. So the broad theme of this uh, lecture will be on nature. Now, nature is actually a very broad word. So for simplicity, we have decided to split it into two parts. And the, the topic of this lecture will uh, deal with the mysteries of the universe, right? And to deliver this lecture, we have uh, Professor Supreet Singh from the physics department of uh, IIT Delhi. Uh, uh, Supreet did his PhD from Ayuka Pune under the uh, under the guidance of Professor late Professor Thanu Padmanabhan. After which he spent some time as a DS Kothari Fellow at University of Delhi, and then he was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of New Brunswick. Uh, and uh, Supreet, as I told you, will be talking, telling us about the mysteries of the universe right from the point it started to where we are now. So, Supreet, uh, whenever you're ready. Sure. Thanks, Abhishek. Thanks for uh, the nice introduction. And uh, yes, I think we can begin. Uh, I'll share my screen. So let me know if you can see uh, a rather blank screen with just my name on it, uh, the date and the logos. Yes, so we can. Okay, thank you so much. So normally, when we give all these lectures, we we sort of come around, give a lecture, give you a bunch of information, and we disappear. Today, I would like to do it slightly differently. Of course, given the format, uh, there are some things, but the core idea of uh, the lecture and is to ignite the curiosities which you all have already about our universe and motivate you to look up in the sky because there's a lot of physical phenomena waiting to be understood. So there's a lot of things which we understand, and there's lots that we still don't. And so each of these, when we observe, we have in our observations an ability to comprehend what is really happening. We can understand what is happening millions of light years away. We can also understand what is happening on Earth itself, our own planet. So Sky has been the oldest lab for this uh, understanding. And that is where we begin. So the lecture is about Sky, our oldest lab. So you can see in the first slide itself, there's a video where you see a comet. It, it was Comet Neowise. The pictures were taken by me. There are a lot of things which are happening over here. If you clearly observe, you see that there were a lot of stars and the comet also had two tails, not just one tail, but two of them. And there was an angle between them. There's a difference between the two. There's a different physics involved between the two. So as to give you the two angles, you would look at them, observe them, look out what, what their wavelengths are, what is the light that is coming from there. And you see that one of them is a tail which is composed of sodium atoms. You're getting a yellow color out of that. And then there was another tail which was, is composed of dust, ice, water, vapor, and all that. 
And so you understand what is really happening in an object which is so far away. And in fact, comets which come from really far outskirts of the solar system travel inside, circle the sun, and go away. They're actually like fossils. They were created during the first instances of our solar system, and they have not changed much. So if you find if you find more about comets, we basically are finding out how our unit, our solar system really formed. But then you saw all these clouds which also came in. The clouds, when they come up, they're covering the sky. You're basically having light which is passing through all these clouds. It is undergoing scattering. Okay. Each of these photons which are coming through, they're being scattered all around. So you learn also about our atmosphere, how our atmosphere is affecting the stars and the light from various celestial objects. So there's lots to learn from small observations. There's a physics to be learned, and that is the key point uh, of this particular talk today. So it's about observing, understanding, and predicting, which I also like to put as uh, all another three uh, things as engineering, physics, and mathematics, how it, they all three come together as amalgamation. And in order, by combining all three of them, we sort of understand more about our universe. So let's start. So in order to learn more about the universe, the first thing you want to do is you're going to map it. You want to know where these things are. Another thing about science is reproducibility. If you find a phenomena that happens in the sky at some point, you are you should be able to tell the other person where that happened, so that the person that the other person can also see it and confirm it, and that is where the reproducibility is important. That it is really a part of scientific procedure. So you want to know where things are in the sky, how to map those things. You'll be seeing a lot of pictures during this talk. Uh, a lot of them are actually taken by me. And those that have been taken by me will have uh, will be annotated by uh, my acronym, the abbreviate SS uh, on the bottom. And you can find a lot of these pictures also on an Instagram on my channel, Cosmo Backyard, because our backyard is really the cosmos. So here you see uh, quite an interesting thing. This is actually a picture of the Milky Way, our own galaxy, the center of our own galaxy. You see lots of things there. The first thing you notice, there's a lot of dust. The black areas, there's not, it's, they're not really empty. They compose of dust particles, which are not allowing light to pass through. In fact, there's something which we'll touch upon during this talk. And then you see these uh, objects which are bright and emitting light. These are the nebulies, where in some nebulies, there is active star formation happening. New stars are being formed. How do we know that these are nebulies? We look at the particular light they are emitting. That is their signature. The signature here, for instance, the color magenta that lies in the red regime of the visible spectrum. It's emitted by particularly by hydrogen atoms. So we know there's ample amounts of uh, ample amount of hydrogen which is present in these objects in these parts. So there's a lot of physics to learn about just by observing various things. And that is what we're gonna do. And people have been doing this for a long time. This is why I said it's an oldest lab. The record keeping has been on since ancient times. As a particular example of a bronze plate, which was unearthed from a place in Germany. So it's around 1600 BC old. And you can see various stations on it. Particularly, you can see something which there are these group of stars. Possibly, this is the Pleiades open cluster. You can easily make it out in, uh, if you look in, into the uh, eastern sky uh, these days. And then you see the moon, and you can see a full circle. There's possibly could be a full moon or could be the sun, and various other things. So, the record keeping has been there since early times. People have been interested in astronomy, and that's what got them started into finding out more about our universe. So much so that they developed various techniques. This is how geometry developed. People uh, invented, the telescope was invented. 
people are looking at the heavens, how things are moving across the sky, and they want you to see how things move. The sky you see when you look at the sky, it, it's like a, a sphere which you're looking at and things are moving. So you need to know how things are moving along curves and the angles they, between them. So you develop geometry and this, the geometry was developed and it was applied to physics and I, it was applied to astronomy as well. So for mapping the sky, you also use astronomy or geometry. How do you do that? Well, there's various ways to do it. One of them is you stand where you are and you, then you put, give coordinates to various objects in the sky. For instance, you can stand such that you're facing the north. Okay, take a magnetic compass, find out where north is, face yourself. Once you have that, you have identified four directions around you, north, west, east, and south. You have two points, which is directly above you, which is zenith, and then you have nadir, which is directly below you. We'll be using only the upper portion. And now you can draw an imaginary line joining the north and south, which you'll call the meridian. It basically divides the whole sphere, hemisphere, into two halves, the eastern one and the western one. Now you can easily give coordinates to any object in the sky. Let's say you have a star, you look up at this particular star and you find two numbers. One is the altitude, how high it is above your horizon. That's the altitude. And then what angle does it make if you move, how far have you moved away from your north position? Because you started off facing north, but in order to face at the star, you have to move away from the north. So that we call as the azimuth. So you have two numbers to specify where this particular object is. This particular system is called the Oort Azimuth coordinate system. It is basically tied to wherever you are. You are standing there. You are giving these coordinates to various objects. There's something special. There's uh, since our Earth is rotating, there is a point which we call as the North Celestial Pole. It lies directly above the axis of rotation of the Earth. It's easy to find. At present, there is a star named Polaris, which is near the North Celestial Pole. So if you find the location of Polaris, you're basically facing the North Celestial Pole. And depending upon where you are on Earth, this star or the North Celestial Pole will look, will be at an angle. There is, of course, it is in the North, so that is why the azimuth is zero. It's directly facing the North, but then it is at particular altitude. That altitude is given by your latitude. In order to find where you are, you basically look at this North Star and find the angle it makes. That tells you the latitude of where you are on Earth. Of course, so you can draw another imaginary line, which we call as the celestial equator. Just like you view, you have a horizon over here, which is 90 degrees to the top point, which is zenith. If you, the celestial equator is the one which is 90 degrees to the line joining you and this North Celestial Pole. So you imagine a line joining you and Polaris. This equator is 90 degrees to you. It's useful. Why? Because the Earth, as I told you, is rotating, rotating around an axis. And this axis is this particular axis around the, which is passing through the North Celestial Pole. So therefore, all the stars, Earth is moving. The star seems to rise and set. They move around in circles like these. Let us take a, look, uh, take a look at it again. They're moving around in circles like this. So you have stars which will rise and set. So note that this is a view from the Northern Hemisphere, the North. If you go to the Southern latitudes near Australia, New Zealand or somewhere, or in Africa, South America, you will find the opposite way. But nevertheless, let's still look at it from the Northern Hemisphere when we see that this the stars are moving around in these circles. Well, you could also look at it in another way. Suppose I put a torch over here and shine a light through it. You can flatten this thing out, and here is another way to give coordinates. So your circles are basically circles of constant alt altitude. So let's do it again. So you have a star over here, which is supposed to rise, and then it will set. So this is north. Again, this is west, east, and south. The stars will rise from the east and set in the west. So they'll make an arc as they go along. When they're rising, the altitude is 
zero, and when they come, when they uh, they rise through throughout the night, their altitude changes. They come to the maximum altitude, and the maximum altitude is when they pass this imaginary line, which connects north and south, the meridian. So let's do over this animation again. So you see, this star has gone from here to here in a curve. So it's gone, it's crossed the meridian, which is this imaginary line joining north and south. So again, if you want, you can give coordinate, you can find what is the altitude of a star and the azimuth as it goes throughout the whole period of from rising to setting. And you can plot it on this particular graph. And this is what gives you these pictures like these. Stars are moving around. So if you have a camera, you open it up for a long time, the stars move. So this creates these star trails. You see that they are moving around. There's something which is not really moving much. They're moving around a common center. Since they're moving around a common center, what is that center? Let's look at this again. The center is the North Pole. So there's another way to find the North Pole. You open your camera for a long time, take a picture like this. This is your North Pole or the North Celestial Pole where Polaris is. So the star which is close to the, uh, the center is Polaris. Now you can do this activity at your home. Make a contraption like this. It's basically just a protractor, a D, which you all have seen. You can cut this shape out. It's basically, again, uh, so you have to find two coordinates, right? Altitude and azimuth. This is telling you where the star is looking at. So this is how you divided it. This is north, east, west, and south. You kept it here. And you keep uh, a protractor, which is a half, zero to 90 thing is here. And then you have a straw. And you keep a, keep a small washer or something, a weight, hang it from a thread, which is vertically down. So it will tell you when you are really leveled on the horizon because you want to know where the zero of the altitude is. And then you can look through this to various stars in the sky and you will be rotating it. So wherever you are, so you, it will tell you azimuth. You read azimuth from here and you read altitude from here. That this washer, which whatever that weight is, it will hang directly down. It points to the center of the earth. So you read off your altitude and azimuth. So you can do this exercise at home. You can use various apps to find out where Polaris is. There are different applications uh, to do that. One of them is Polar Scope Align Pro. You don't need to pay for it. There's a free version out there. You can find, you can level this thing using a bubble level, or you can use a magnetic compass if you have those. But these things are also built up in, built in your smartphones these days. So you can easily do that using a smartphone. So make sure you do make this contraption and then you can use this graph paper. It's again the same thing and you can point out. So when the star rises, it should be here in the outer circle. The altitude is zero and when it sets, it will come over here. If this is, if you designate this as the north, this as the west. So it will go through a particular path along this trajectory. So make sure you do this exercise and I'll also have put forward one another activity at the end. Uh, so as to have some sort of an interaction. You can find out where are the, all these objects. Because you need some sort of patterns and these patterns are what we call constellations, which have been designed from ancient times. Various point constellations allow you to identify where objects are in the sky. Like for instance, there's a famous constellation of Orion, which you can see these days, I mean, uh, during the nights, you go out, look for it in the between uh, 9 p.m. or something, you'll be easily be able to spot Orion. Okay. And you can again use apps, applications like Sky Safari and Google Sky Map to find out various objects in the sky. It is basically around telling you what objects are present where. So you can look for it. And there are various shapes of these constellations. It's basically imaginary shapes. There's no linkage between the various stars in a constellation. These stars are not really linked together, but they just form a particular shape. 
and these shapes allow us to identify where these each of these objects are in the sky. There's another way to find out angles in the sky because you really want to do it. If you don't have a protractor or something, you can quickly do it by using your own hand. Okay, you can find out the angle of separation between the objects from one degrees to twenty five degrees. Here's a constellation of the Big Dipper. Looks like a dipper. This this is where how to find Polaris is. The the dimensions of this constellation is around 25 degrees. So you, you can easily use this. And in fact, this may not be actually 25 degrees. So here's a good thing to do. You can make that contraction, which I spoke about. It's called the theodolite. And you can find the actual angle. And then you can calibrate your hands. This is what we do in science. We calibrate stuff to as so as to find what is the standard. So you use some standard, something which is where we know what the angle actual angles would be. And we can find what they uh, what it would be for something which is unknown. So once you have calibrated your uh, your own the dimensions of your own hands, you can use them to find these angular separations between the objects. Like for instance, I mentioned the Orion constellation. If you look at the belt of Orion, there are these three stars which make up the Orion's belt. The roughly the angular separation here is around three degrees. So the span of Orion's belt from here to this star is three degrees in, in the sky. So I have a question. How many fists if you have, if you stack them one on top of another, would it take to you for you to reach from horizon to zenith? So if you are at the horizon, which is level zero, altitude zero, and now you have to go to Zenith, which is directly on top of you, the point. How many fists does it will it require? You can answer this question. Try to find the answer to it. Yes, it should be nine because the angle is 90 degrees. So you start nine of them each 10 degrees. So as to go from horizon to Zenith and try it out. Can you do it in real life as well? So you can understand a lot of things about just by noticing how objects are moving across the sky. Here, for instance, some pictures, which is telling you these are star stars which are rising in the east. It's a 10 minute exposure. So during 10 minutes, they have moved this much. This is uh, a 10 minute exposure uh, facing uh, south and slightly west. And this is a 10 minute exposure facing entirely west. So you see the stars are rising and the stars are setting in the west again a lot of things so you see it's since this, and this, the motion is almost steady they are all 10 minute exposures the arcs which these stars have made are almost the same so the motion is really steady in 10 minutes each of these star move through an angle of 2.5 degrees so the so that would be 5 degrees in 20 minutes 7.5 degrees in 30 minutes 15 degrees in an hour and over a 24 hour day, the rotation would be 360 degrees. Well, I'm not being completely exact here. It's slightly less than 15 in an hour, but we'll not be worrying about those effects. Let's take it to be 15 degrees. Here's another question. How many minutes would it take for a star to move just one degree? Stars are moving. And each of in 10 minutes, the star move through an angle of 2.5 degrees. Where is an angle? They make a common angle. So there is a center over there. You can find an arc. So it makes an angle of 2.5 degrees. So you, as I said, you can find out what is how many, if you want to move one degree, how many minutes will it take? Yes, it'll take around four minutes. So in the northern sky, all, as I mentioned, in the, also in the picture, all stars move at the same rate around a common center. And in this 75 minute, exposure, the stars moved by 19 degrees. So they make an arc and that is an arc of 19 degrees in 75 minutes. So if you want to find out, let's see. Okay. So you will be around 3 point, uh, close to 4 minutes, around 3.7 or something like that. Okay. 
Now here's another thing. You have another picture. This is a picture of Orion, which is near the Western horizon. Okay. And you're seeing that the Orion, this picture was taken near the Western horizon. And you see that there is a particular time period when the camera was open for, because that is why you are seeing these star trails. Is the Orion rising or setting? Since it was taken near the Western horizon, the answer is it is setting. Why? Because stars set in, generally they would set in the West. Then the question is from what latitude was this photo taken? And you can easily find that out as well. Let's look at that picture again. Since this was taken in the West, Orion is a constellation. The one which I showed you earlier. This. So you're looking towards the West. Since look, you're looking towards the West, the streaks are basically from South to North. So they're from South to North. So that is that tells you that you are in the Northern Hemisphere. So it has to be north. And what angle do they make from the vertical tells you where this picture was taken, what was the latitude? Because that is the angle. This is the angle which tells you what is where you are. So it is around 20 degrees north where this picture was taken. The, the angle which these lines make with the vertical. Now the next question is how long was the camera shutter open? It was open for five minutes. Again, why? I told you that the angular separation of the Orion's belt is around three degrees. And these streaks are almost one degree. So one degree rotation requires four minutes. So this was roughly five minute exposure, which was taken. So just by looking at a simple picture, you are able to tell a lot about where this uh, picture was taken. Remember, this is actually a big thing. So you, you basically on the surface of the earth, there could be lots of points just by looking at it. You are actually zeroed down from a surface full surface of the earth to just one latitude, which is 20 degrees north. So that's one line. So even though there would be a lot of points on the I mean, it's infinity of points on the line as well, but still it's a big reduction. So you know where the latitude of the place was, at least with this where this picture was taken. Now, as I was telling you that this is a coordinate system which you would use, which is wherever you are, you could just find out what is the altitude of a, a star and its azimuth. Now, suppose you have a friend who is somewhere else. Let's say you are in Delhi and your friend is in Mumbai and you tell that person, okay, I've observed something. There was a meteor or a, there was a comet which I have observed. It is at altitude, uh, let's say 40 degrees and an azimuth of uh, uh, it was in the west, so 90 degrees uh, to the north. So you can also go up on your rooftop and look at it at these particular coordinates. You will see that if the person goes up and looks up at the sky at the location which you have told, it would be different. Why? Because you are on Earth and it's a curved surface. It's a ball, right? So it's a sphere. So if you go to a different place, you are changing your latitude. Remember, the North Celestial Pole was at a given latitude, so the whole thing rotates. Since, so you need a way, a universal way to tell some coordinates to a friend of yours so that that person can then find out in his frame where these objects would be. What would be the altitude and azimuth for that particular object? Now, there is a universal coordinate system which exists, which we call as the Celestial Coordinate System or the equatorial coordinate system it is basically again you have the earth as i told you the earth is rotating around its axis we can take that axis and expand around that axis so let's call this as the north celestial pole which is the north up here so this is what we call as the celestial sphere and all and we need to give coordinates so there are these stars which are all around us we need to give coordinates again to these stars. We need to tell where these are. So just like when we did for the alt azimuth, we set a zero at the north. We need to set our zero of our scale, right? Whenever we are measuring something, we need to set where the zero is. We need a zero here as well. 
the zero can e can be gotten from e very easily. Again, since we are looking at the north, this is telling us the the north celestial pole is at 90 degrees. So we are starting from 0, 15, 30, 45, 60, and going up to 90. The polaris is up here. So that is the declination of that we call these as declinations. And then the sun moves around the earth. I mean, in the earth's frame of reference, generally the earth is moving around the sun. But if you look at from the earth's point of view, the sun is moving around. And in one year, the sun will go around this particular path, which we call the ecliptic. Because the Earth's axis is, is at an angle of 45 degrees, uh, at, at an angle of 23 degrees, this, this path which sun takes is also at an angle of 23 degrees. And this red line is the one which we call as the celestial equator. Remember the one which we drew there, which was 90 degrees to the pole. So Polaris is here, the pole, pole is over here. This is the celestial equator. The line, the ecliptic, where it cuts the equator, we call it the zero degrees. So that is what we set as the zero. Of course, it will cut at two different points. One is during the spring and one is during the autumn. We will take the spring uh, equinox. So these are what we call as equinoxes and we'll take one of them to be the zero. So now you can give coordinates to every star or every object in the sky, which we call right ascension and declination. So declination is these latitudes, just like you have latitudes on Earth, you have latitudes on the celestial sphere. So suppose you have an object here at this particular point, you can see that the latitude or the declination is 30 degrees and how much you have to go fr from zero to here you have to go three hours so the right ascension is three hours so again you have coordinates three hours and 30 degrees so if you tell your friend that you go to a right ascension of three hours declination of 30 degrees your friend can calculate what altitude and azimuth the person has to go to and they can find the object this is a universal coordinate system which we all use how do you find the where the zero lies? The stars are almost fixed. So there is a constellation called Pegasus, which is like a square. You can look at that constellation and you can find that is your zero RA line. And this is what the Pegasus square looks like. So you see the square which comes up. This, so I'm, this is me, I'm standing over there. I'm actually facing the line of zero right ascension. So if you look up this constellation, the square, the square of Pegasus tells you where the right ascension or zero of right ascension is. So if you tell your friends about RA and declination of a particular object, they can simply go to their local frame there where they are, wherever they are and rotate it, the celestial sphere, and they can find what is the altitude and the azimuth of that particular object. This rotation, again, will depend upon where, what is their latitude, because the angle the polaris, the pole star makes is given by your latitude. Okay. This tells something interesting. It also tell, it tells something interesting about how, why we have seasons on Earth. During summer, sun makes a giant loop across the sky, whereas during winters, the loop across the sky is small, smaller. Why is that? As I said, the sun during one year, during one year, 365 days, it is moving across this ecliptic. And in summer, it is over here. And when it will rise, it will rise along this particular arc. And during winter, it has traveled to here. So if it rises and set, it will rise and set along this particular arc. So you see less of a sun in the northern hemisphere during the winter than during the summer. And that makes for you this various seasons on Earth. Okay. So this is how the sun is moving. And in fact, how we find time on Earth is also related to that. Because time is, we find time by how periodic the processes are. The whole trip around the sun takes 365 days. 
So you can find how the sun is moving in those 365 days and hence find what time is it on a various. In fact, you can know more about the earth from this as well. That is what I mentioned. Not just the sky, you can know about our own earth. What is the radius of earth was actually computed by the Greeks by looking at what angle the sun is at a particular time during the year. They knew that when the solstice or the equinox takes place, the rays of the sun are exactly parallel. The sun is directly overhead. Since it is directly overhead, by knowing the separation between two places, so there was there's a place in Alexandria and there is place Syene, there is an ang angle between the two rays at these two places. By finding out what the angle is, they can actually find what is the circumference of the earth. This is actually the, uh, the, the, they should lie on the same longitude. So basically you're finding out what is the circumference or the, uh, or what is the length of a longitude, but it tells you a close estimate of what is the circumference of the earth. So the Greeks found it around 40,000 kilometers, which is very close to our current estimates. So you can find out a lot by simply observing various phenomena in the sky. Here is another one. So we're, we're talking about the sun. So let us see what we can find from by observing the sun. So here's a picture of the sun. You see that the sun is brighter in the center and darker near the edges. This is not a, a not due to a, how the picture was taken, but this is due to some physical phenomena. What physical phenomena that is? You go and look at the physics of it, and you see that when the when light is emitted from inside the sun, it has to cross the atmosphere of the sun in order to come out. This time, when it crosses the atmosphere, it scatters around. It bounces back uh, across the various gases which are present here in, uh, in the atmosphere of the sun. And so what you see is how deep are you looking inside the sun? So you don't see too deep inside the sun. You see only till what we call as the one mean free path that it, it has to bounce back and forth. And it bounces back and forth such that on an average, it will take a particular length to go through from center to us. So when we are looking at the surface of the sun, when we are looking at the edge, we are looking or, or at the center, we are at the center, we are looking much deeper than what we are looking near the edges. So at the edge, we see the outer surface of the sun and in the, near the center, we are seeing the much deeper into the sun. Since the temperature inside the sun is much larger than outside, you see that it is brighter near the center and darker near the edges. So this simple, effect that is brighter near the center and darker at the edges is simply understood by knowing what is really happening inside the sun. That the light which is coming to us, it is not coming to us directly. It is really bouncing back and forth before it really emerges out and comes to earth. So there's a lot of physics which is to be learned. And in fact, the same thing happens also in our galaxy. There's a lot of dust in our galaxy. For instance, there's a picture of the Cygnus region of our galaxy where you see lots of nebulae and dust. Remember, I spoke about dust. So when light is coming through various stars, it has to cross through this dust. When it crosses through dust, it also scatters around. Since it scatters around, Either it would be absorbed by the dust or it will, it will be reflected to some other region by the dust. And the same way we know about the sun as the light comes through the sun, we, we get to know about the atmosphere of the sun. 
we can find out what is there in our galaxy when light comes through this particular passes through the dust scatters around in fact this is the same thing the same phenomena which leads you why you why the sky is blue so if you look at the sky during the daytime you see the sky is blue because the blue light is really scattered the most whereas the longer wavelength the red light which is a longer wavelength it is not scattered by the particles in the atmosphere in our sky so you see a blue sky in daytime due to scattering and during sunset the the light has to travel a much longer distance to come to you because the sun is very low near the horizon so you will not see the blue light but you will see the red light which can scat which can pass through without bouncing around that is why the sunsets are red and the daytime sky is blue and that is the same thing which is also happening if you are looking at objects which are outside our galaxy so if you are looking at galaxies which are outside our galaxy our milky way we are because we are inside our galaxy so there is suppose there's a galaxy outside the milky way and you are looking at it like andromeda uh let's see i'll have a picture of andromeda somewhere so if you're looking at andromeda the light which is coming from that galaxy has to pass through our own galaxy and when it passes through our own galaxy again what will it do it will scatter around since it scatters around it will cause a, you you can learn about from that scattering how the brightness of this particular object has changed by looking at the scattering you can find out more about our own galaxy in fact this is another thing is you have the dust in between so suppose you have a star which are very nearby and you have a lot of dust in between so this dust as i just in a similar way our atmosphere functions it will reflect blue light and pass red light so that is why sometimes you will see objects in the sky like this this is the pleiades open cluster so you have a star you have a bunch of stars in a cluster and hot stars they are emitting that light the light from the the dust cloud in between there's a lot of dust in between it is reflecting we are over here for this particular system so we are seeing a blue reflection that is why you see a blue reflection of the gas of the light from which is coming from these star, these stars so the all of dust and gas here it is reflecting that blue light to us the red light is going somewhere else now there could be areas where there would be we are sitting over here we are not here but we are here so we will see more of the red transmission and that is what is happening over here so do you see the black region here this is the horse nebula this black region is not really empty but there's a lot of dust here so there is no region in space that is empty there is dust and that dust is actually blocking the red emission which is behind and the dust also appears slightly red because we are directly behind the dust in this particular case so just by observing what was happening in the sun for instance that it was darker near the edges and brighter in the center and we found out about scattering and that scattering of light we applied to also to the other places uh, in our sky such as the we looked at the pleiades open cluster we look at the horse nebula we understand what is really happening this is how universal physics is there's one concept which applies to one system can apply to another system as well the same concepts apply everywhere so this is the map of the sort of milky way which we currently have of course the the picture is not the actual picture of the milky way because you cannot go outside the galaxy and uh, look at it so this is a representation of what it is but we can see various objects here in the sky and this is what so this is the center of our galaxy and we are somewhere here that is our position of the uh, of the so our solar system and various things which we saw we saw the pleiades constellation it is over here the orion nebula is over here and then there are various other constellations the cygnus region which we saw is over here in this particular arm of our galaxy and galaxies and the once we look out of our milky way we will see galaxies which are really far out 
So this is what uh, this is another way to represent what our sky looks like. In this particular representation, the the Milky Way, this is our galaxy, the Milky Way, is put at the right at the center. And when we go up and down, we are going up above and below this particular disk. So this disk of our galaxy is not, uh, it, it's, it has a particular thickness. So it has a thickness about this much, and you can go up and below. So just like you have latitudes and longitudes on Earth, we can call this as going up or down as the, lat uh, the galactic latitudes. We are going up in galactic plane and down in galactic plane, so galactic latitudes. And we can go from right to left, which are called the galactic longitudes. So you have the same representation here. So you can give the objects various representation where they are, which, what are their coordinates. So if you see over here, there's actually a blob. This is where the, so the galaxy Andromeda, which is the nearest galaxy to us, it lies out. It is actually outside the plane of our galaxy. So when we are looking at it, just like I showed here, Andromeda is some, somewhere here and light is coming from Andromeda, it has to pass through the disk of our galaxy to come to us. So we can find out what is in our galaxy by looking at how the magnitude of Andromeda or the how the light of Andromeda has changed. Uh, so Keith? And this is what Andromeda, yes, am I there? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is Abhishek. Uh, do you want to take some questions now or uh, uh, you are very close to the first break? Yeah, so I'll, uh, just, just a couple of minutes and then I'll stop. Sure. Sounds good. Okay. So here's a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, which we can observe from the Earth. How bright are these objects? Well, we can find those things out as well, how, how bright something is. There's a system which we use we call which call it the magnitude system we give them a number that tells us how bright these objects are so we measure how much light we are getting from it okay, just like for instance let me take an example so suppose you have a truck with its headlights on okay the truck has so that truck could be at a different distance to you so if it is far away, it, the lights would seem dimmer. But if the truck is nearby, the light would seem brighter. So the actual brightness, of course, depends upon the distance that particular object is. You can have two objects of the same brightness, but one is far away, one is nearby. So the object which is far away will actually look dimmer to you than the object which is nearby. So this is what we call as the actual, so if you want to find what is their actual brightness, we need to know their distances. But you can still find what we call as the apparent magnitude. That is how bright do they look compared to another one. So I suppose if you're looking at this, the moon and you're looking at the sun, how bright does the sun look compared to, a, let's say a full moon. So we gave a number to them, which are called magnitudes, basically related to how much light we are getting from them. The magnitude of sun is around minus 26. The moon is uh, minus 12. So we can find how bright the sun is compared to the moon by finding out what is the difference of their magnitudes. So the difference of their magnitudes is around, my, is around 14. Now, the magnitudes lie on a scale which we call a logarithmic scale which tells you that if you have a star or an object of magnitude one, and you have another star which is of magnitude six, the brightness, difference of brightness between them is a hundred times. So difference of five magnitudes is around hundred. So let us break this down. This 14 can be broken down into 10, five and one. So five gives you a hundred. So what the calculation, the rule goes like this. So we have broken this down into plus and minuses. And when we want to find how bright they are, we make them plus into a multiplication and minus into a division. That's the rule in the logarithm. So five is like 100. 10 is a factor of two. I mean, two times five makes a 10, right? 
So it is 100 times 100, so that is 10,000. And one is around 2.52. So this tells you that the sun is brighter than the full moon by 400,000 units. That's how bright the sun is than full moon. And similarly, you can find the brightness of various objects in the sky, the various stars in the sky, by looking at what their magnitudes are, how bright they would be relative to another one. Okay. The last thing which we want when we want to map we'll, before we take a break is we want to find what are the distances to these objects. And as I told you, in order to find distances, you can look at the light which is coming from them. So think about an object which is emitting light. So here we have a star which is emitting light. Light is spreading out equally in all directions. Since light is spreading out equally in all, all directions, we know how much how many photons will that star has emitted. The whole light is spread out on this particular circle in this case, and in actual three dimension, this would be a sphere. So it moves around a sphere, it goes equally in all directions. So the amount of light which you will get here would be just be a fraction of the total light which it was emitting spread out over this surface, over this full sphere. The area is 4 pi r square, the distance is 4 pi r square, as a distance is r, the area is 4 pi r square. So by knowing, if you know how many, how much light it emitted in the first place and how much light you got, you can therefore find what is the distance to that particular object. So you need to know, therefore, what, so in, in order to do that, you need to know how much light they are emitting in the first place. That is where there are certain objects for which we do know what light they would be emitting, what, how much light they would be emitting. And those are what we call a standard candle. But is there some standard which we know the bright, their intrinsic brightness, intrinsic luminosity, how much light they are emitting, and we know how much light we are getting in our cameras. We can find out the distances to those objects. That is how the distance they are. And I'll stop here for a break and then we'll continue the next part of the talk. Which is understanding the universe. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Supreet. Uh, we actually have uh, several questions. Uh, in, in fact, they are quite uh, diverse in the questions which have been asked. So what I will do is I will pick the questions which are relevant to the topics discussed now and we can come back to the other questions later uh, towards the end of the sure. talk. So the first question yeah. we have is from uh, Aditya Kambete. Let's see if we can unmute him. Uh, Swamik, can we unmute Aditya Kambete so that uh, he can ask his question? Gaurav? Let's see. I'm trying to encourage the students Hello? to ask the question on their own. Sir, am I audible? Yes, Aditya, please go ahead. Ask your question. Yes, you're audible. My first question is, why can't we use simple coordinates of the metric system, which is x, comma, y, comma, z? Okay. So, the simple coordinates, so again, when you're looking up at the sky, it is a sphere, right? Suppose I give you a ball. And I put a sticker on a ball at some particular point and I tell you where that sticker, tell me where that sticker is. So what coordinates will you give or it's the same thing as. Uh, like, for instance, we are getting we, we give locations to various places on Earth, right? How do we give locations to various places on Earth? We say that. The location is given by a latitude, let's say Delhi. Delhi is at 28 degrees latitude north and 77 degrees of uh, longitude towards the east. We have set up a zero at the Greenwich Meridian, which is the which passes through Greenwich and London. So it is towards the east of 75 degrees. That is again why we need to use these coordinates because we are on a curved surface. We are not on a plain sheet of paper. If something is on a plain sheet of paper, we can use the standard X Y coordinates. Here we need uh, the coordinates which are on, which we, we want to find of where the objects are in the sky, and the sky is curved. Okay, 
So you need to find angles to various objects where they are. So that is why we are using these angles. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Sukhi. Yes. Thanks. So you. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I thought you finished the answer. No, I was no, I was just saying yes. You can. So we are we are only interested in finding where they are on the sky plane. So that is why we are looking at just the angles. If you add the distance to them, then perhaps yes, you can use your standard x y coordinates as well. In that would but that would not be suitable for computations. Uh, thanks, Supri. Thanks, Aditya. Uh, so the, the next question is from uh, Neil Kamal Sarma. Uh, Neil Kamal. Uh, Is Neil Kamal here? I don't see uh, Neil Kamal being able to uh, speak, or at least I can't hear him. Anyway, I will read out uh, the question by Neil Kamal. How can we see the Milky Way in pictures if we are living in it? Good question. So again, let's go back to that image here. So since we are here, when we look up in the sky, we can see the this particular portion. So this is the center. We can look at it, and which when we look at it, I mean, we are basically when we, we are looking up, we are all of the all of this particular portion is squashed in. So that is why when we see, we see a band across the sky. That particular band is this portion squashed in. So we are only seeing part of the Milky Way. That is what, the different sides. So as in this particular band, we're not seeing the full disk from the outside. Does okay. that, that make sense? He, okay, I can't hear uh, Neil Kamal uh, at the moment. So let's hope uh, the answer was clear. Uh, let's uh, move on to another question. There are a lot of questions on YouTube as well, but all of them are related to the Big Bang. So maybe we can come to that towards the end of the next, uh, uh, yeah. after the next part is over. So uh, the viewers on YouTube, uh, don't worry, we are looking at your questions, but we will come back. That is that okay, Supreet? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we will come to your questions regarding the Big Bang Theory at the end of the talk, so don't worry. The the next question we will take is from uh, Diksha Singh. Uh, Diksha, Diksha, are you audible? I can't uh, find. Anyway, so the question is, what is Zenith? Oh, zenith is the point which is directly above your head. So if you're standing, the point directly above your head, that's zenith. Okay. All right. So maybe we will take uh, one final question and then uh, one second. Just give me a second. <clears throat> there are lots of questions which keep popping up here. So they yes. sometimes they're this like they distractions, but okay. Okay, I think let's see. Uh, again, uh, many questions are related to uh, uh, the universe and the origins of the universe. So again, uh, we will come to it at the end of uh, the next session. Okay, so let's see. Let's see if I can pick up one more question before we move on. I'm just trying to browse through it. So one question is, what is Orion? By Pratik. Pratik, are you here? Pratik Agrawal? Yes, sir. Pratik? Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, Pratik Agrawal. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. I was asking what is Orion? Yes. So let's, I think, uh, let's wait for Supreet because. Uh, Supreet? Huh, Just, I, uh, I think I, yeah, I you're got connected lost now. in between. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, Pratik, please uh, ask your question again, please. Yes, sir. I was asking that like, what is Orion? Like questions were there asked by Sir MCK. Okay, so, yes. And that Orion was asked, so what is Orion? 
Yes, so the Orion is a constellation, is a group of stars which uh, make a pattern like that of a hunter. So did I show, I think I showed the, um, the picture of Orion at some point. Um, so you have constellations in the sky, basically stars which are forming apparent pat patterns. There are no linkage between them. This is Orion. It's a very famous constellation. Okay, you. you can go out and look at it. Uh, yeah. Thank you, sir. And that's good. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your questions. Uh, so there is a hand raised by Janvi Sharma. Janvi Sharma, I could you please go ahead? What is your question about? Yes, sir. Sir, am I audible? Yes, you are. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Sir, I wanted to ask that you told uh, about the sun as to how can we measure the brightness uh, that the sun, it is more brighter. It appears uh, brighter from within and it's kind of darker at the edges. Sir, I wanted to confirm uh, and I wanted to ask that uh, if we talk about moon, when the phenomena of moon can be observed because it is a reachable place, we can perhaps go there and can observe the things and phenomena which are going on over there. So, but sir, with the sun, it is not possible to go and observe the things. What is going inside uh, it and what is going within and around it. So, so how are we able to uh, judge about the things uh, which are going on and happening with the sun? Yeah, that's a good question. So, yes, we actually know much more about our sun than we know about our earth, what is happening inside the earth. It so happens. The reason is that uh, the light which is coming from the, from the sun is powered by nuclear reactions. And how do we know that they're powered by nuclear reactions? Well, um, the so I'm, I'm I was coming to that. Actually, there was so you there are some we can find when we use uh, when we look at the light which is coming, we can do spectroscopy. We can find what frequencies are there in, and each frequency gives us the elements which from which the, that light really came from, the kind of atoms which the light originated. And there are certain atoms which are found in the sun, which uh, uh, which are not we cannot synthesize them on Earth. They're found in stars, which are not synthesized, which we cannot make on Earth yet. So, but we find them on Earth as well. So that sort of tells us that the reactions which they came from are nuclear reactions, and the and also the fact that the material on Earth. So how do we know that we are made of stuff which was actually cooked up in the stars? The reason again is if you look at, let's say uh, a carbon atom, carbon atom comes in different isotopes, right? It has uh, different varieties. So there's a C14 and a C12. It so happens that the chemical reactions, the usual chemical reactions do not differ between these two isotopes. And they, they're the same for both the isotopes and they will not change the fraction of them as well. The how much of C14 is versus C12 the fraction will not be changed by chemical reactions. It is decided by the nuclear reactions. So when we find the, if we, we find the, if you take a piece of amber hair or something, we find what is the fraction of C14 to C12, and we find what is the fraction of C14 to C12 in the stars by looking at the spectra, we find that they're the same, they match. So that is why we confirm that this, st this stuff we are made of, it was actually cooked up in the stars. Yes, I got my question. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Janvi, for the question, and thanks, Supreet. Supreet, let's take one question from YouTube, okay? Uh, okay. One question uh, from YouTube by Yuvraj Panwar is that, is there any real photo of the sun available, or are we just assuming its picture? No, so they are. these are all the real pictures of the sun. Now it depends on which, so you'll find various pictures. Now you can observe light in different wavelengths. And that was what I was coming to. There was the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So things will look different in different wavelengths. So all those different pictures are different, are basically representations of the, of the sun or the images of the sun in different wavelengths. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks, Supreet. So Supreet, uh, would you uh, like to begin the next session or uh, take a couple more questions? Uh -huh. 
Sure, we can actually we can begin the next session and then uh, stop and then take for the yeah. question at the end. So I would uh, so I see a couple of hands raised now. We will get back to you. So uh, and we will have a. It's very encouraging. Students are uh, wanting to discuss and interact. Uh, so please uh, uh, bear with us. We will come back to you after the next session. Okay. Thank you, Supreet. You may begin the next session. Sure. Thanks, Sushir. Yeah. So after we have sort of mapped the universe. We can move further and try to understand what are all the processes that are taking place. Already we have seen some of the processes. What what is our window to the to the outer space? The window is through electromagnetic spectrum. Well, now we have added a few more things to it, but mainly we'll be talking about light. So we get light from all the sources, and light comes from it comes in different wavelengths from radio waves to gamma rays and our visible light which what we see through our eyes is only this but this much portion of the full radio full electromagnetic spectrum so if we look at objects in the sky we can look but of course we can it's not that we need to look at we, we, of course our eyes see it in this visible visible wavelength but we can make uh, cameras which can look in various other wavelengths as well we can have telescopes, radio telescopes, which look in radio. In case you have a radio transistor at your home, it is picking up radio waves. So it's catching the signal and converting it into some data, which you can use. Similarly, there are microwaves, ovens in your home. That microwave is also there. There's infrared, UV, and then there are X-rays, which everyone is also familiar with. Um, and then there are gamma rays, a very high frequent, high energy radiation. So we look at these objects, like for instance, this there's a galaxy. It can be seen in different wavelengths. It can be seen in radio. So when you look at it in radio, it looks like this in infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, and X-rays. So if you're looking at a particular object in different wavelengths, you see that you are actually probing, you're actually finding out about the various processes which are happening in this particular object at uh, with different wavelengths at different scales. The radio emission is giving you a diffuse emission throughout the galaxy. Infrared is solely from the dust arms of this galaxy. And then there is the visible from various stars in that galaxy, which the stars emit mainly in the visible light. You have the UV emission, which is clustered. And then you have the X-ray emission, which is even more clustered. So X-ray emission is coming from really hot gases inside the uh, and and the uh, the regions from where the x-ray is coming from and like for instance uh, high intensity objects like pulsars or something neutron stars in those galaxies so you are probing the so it's again a very important physical point the which wavelength do you decide to look at you are probing the physics at that particular scale so you have the full electromagnetic spectrum available. Here is, for instance, the our own galaxy in different wavelengths. So you have a, a galaxy Milky Way in radio from radio to X-ray. So it is probing different phenomena in our galaxy. Another example, here is one single object, which is actually a crab uh, pulsar with so you can see it goes from radio to X-ray. So you have different wavelengths which are coming up. Finally, this is the X-ray. And you can see the size of the region changes as you look at it in different wavelengths. So the shorter wavelengths, you are actually looking at high frequencies, energies, you are looking at the shorter regions. So X-rays are coming from very close to that pulsar. So that is the multi-wavelength astronomy that we use to find out more about what physical phenomena are happening at various scales. The these the multi-wavelength astronomy requires us to use different telescopes. It so happens that our atmosphere is a hindrance. Remember, I mentioned about our atmosphere. The light scatters around, right? The same thing which is applicable in various things is applicable here as well. The light scatters around, bounces around, it comes around. And our atmosphere is not really transparent. It is transparent at optical frequencies. In visible light, we can see the stars. But if our eyes were looking in infrared, for instance, we would not be able to see the sky. 
you will not be able to see the stars because our atmosphere is opaque in the infrared. If we were we, we could see the radio waves, the radio waves can pass through at, through our atmosphere, so we can do radio astronomy from Earth. So our optical telescopes and optical so our optical telescopes visible looking in visible range and radio telescopes we can do from uh, from the surface of the Earth. But if you want to do infrared astronomy, for you get the infrared uh, data and the gamma rays and X-rays, UV, we need to do them from space. So we put those telescopes in the space. But even in uh, optical domain, our uh, atmosphere is not really uh, stable. It, is, it has lots of turbulence. The turbulence comes due to temperature and density variations. And hence the refractive index of air changes. The subtle changes in the refractive index of the air can lead to this, the effects on stars. The stars twinkle, and that is one of the reasons why the scintillation really happens. It is because of the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. So if you want to get even higher resolution, you want to put even the optical, optical telescopes in space. And that is why we put the Hubble telescope out there in the space to get the resolution which would not be limited by uh, the atmosphere effects of our atmosphere. But of course, you can, as I mentioned, by looking at it, you can also learn about our own atmosphere, how it is changing, how dynamic it is. So what can we do with light? We can do four different things. We can do photometry. We can measure the amount of energy arriving from a source. We can do spectroscopy, which is measuring the distribution of light with wavelength, different wavelengths, put a prism and uh, separate out all the wavelengths and see how much intensity is there in which wavelength. We can do imaging, find out where the appearance and positions of objects in the sky. And then there is certain things we call polarimetry. Light also has polarization. It has two states. It comes in two varieties. So we can, by looking at those two different varieties and what kind of polarization it has, we can find some things about uh, objects as well, the kind of light which they are emitting. We'll come to the example of polarization as well at the in this particular talk. So all of them. So here's something which we so when we're looking out, what do we learn about our universe? The first thing is here's the thing which for people earlier thought that Earth was at the center of uh, the the solar system and everything was going around it. And it's a fair a fair assumption and that is how things go in science. You make a postulate and then you test a postulate. You look at an observation and from the observation, you see whether that theory or model is really correct or not. If it is not correct, you chuck it away and come up with an alternate uh, uh, model, which again you test and you do this exercise again and again, the iterative process and you stop when you get the right answer. And this is what the thing is. So we learned about our universe that the Earth is not at the very at the center, but rather the solar system is the sun is at the center. But if you look at the path of Mercury or the uh, path of Mars uh, across the sky, so it so happens if you spotted it at a certain point it, during a year, you will see that Mars will actually go in the sky like this. So this is these are basically pictures of Mars taken during um, and uh, throughout. Uh, uh, a week, I mean, a long duration. So you see that it seems to go backward in the sky. So there's an apparent motion that it is going backward in the sky and then moving like this. And this sort of tells you if if Earth was at the center, then this would not have happened. You would have seen Mars going uh, circling around the Earth. This, is, since Earth is not at the center, but rather Sun is, the Earth is in the inner orbit than Mars. So therefore, at some point, you will see that the Earth overtakes Mars. And since it overtakes Mars, that is why you see this retrograde motion, which looks like an S shape in the sky. So here's a model which you which was earlier given, which was the geocentric model, and that was challenged, and we came out with a heliocentric model of our solar system. As the more we learn about our universe. So we, of course, we need to start from somewhere. We started from our solar system. There's another thing which we learn is, as I mentioned, this is an image of the sun during a solar eclipse. You can see the sun is usually very bright, 
but during a solar eclipse it block the moon blocks out the main disk of the sun so you see the outer corona and you can take that light and send it through a prism and separate it out into different wavelengths and when you do that you look at what these wavelengths correspond to and that is where each of this wavelength is coming from a certain atom certain system atomic system there's a signature of that atom and it so happens the first evidence of helium was actually observed in the sun that is why the name helium is from helios that is in the sky so helium was actually observed on august 18 1868 as a bright yellow line with a wavelength of 587 nanometers in the spectrum of chromosphere of sun it was detected by the french astronomer jules janssen during a total solar eclipse in guntur india okay so this so this particular line is the signature of helium and then it was observed here on earth so there are examples where theories lead to discoveries and then there are examples where observations guide our understanding of theories they like for instance using the newtonian gravity how planets move around the sun uh, alexis bovard he published ta tables of uranus in, uh, in the observations he found certain discrepancies so leverrier took a look took a look at those discrepancies and thought that hey then seems to be if i put a certain another planet there which can change the orbit of uranus slightly i would be able to explain those discrepancies in the orbit of uranus so he looked at the theory and found and told the astronomers look there must be another planet at this point in the sky so he gave them the uh, the location where in sky to look for, look at right ascension and declination or altitude and azimuth and they the astronomers pointed their scope telescopes to that location and they found neptune so neptune was therefore found by just by doing calculations of pen and paper right so here theories which have led to discoveries but the same very year so there was also a discrepancy in the orbit of mercury there's a there's a shift in the orbit of uh, the of the perihelion of mercury it's a 43 arc second per century shift very well discovered that and he tried to find just like he found the uh, a reason for uh, he put a reason as in there was a planet for the discrepancies in uranus he tried to explain the perihelion shift of mercury using the theory but he failed he could not do that fortunately this is this particular observation actually guided a theory einstein kept computing einstein set aside the newtonian theory of gravity enlarged his model If the newtonian gravity is not consistent with this theory of relativity einstein enlarged that model he came out with a number of theories and kept computing this number he stopped when he got the right number that is when we got general relativity the general relativity predicts gives you 43 arc seconds eddington and the, its his team they observed the solar eclipse of 1919 and confirmed that the general relativity was indeed right that light bends when it moves around these uh, massive objects so if you have a star which is behind the sun during the eclipse they found that the stars shift during uh, due to the gravity of the sun so gravity bends light that is the kind of equipment which eddington used during that solar eclipse observations it's a large telescope they had to get a at that time they did not have cameras so they had to have a, a plate a photographic photographic plate so they use a photographic plate and recorded locations and found that how the shifts really happen we have actually been able to test that the general relativity very precisely because the bending of light does not really happen due to sun but it happens due to anything anything which has mass and uh, for instance if you have let's say if you have a galaxy which is behind they have you have a cluster of galaxies and then you have a galaxy which is behind this particular cluster light when it is coming from this particular galaxy it will bend around this and so you will see from the from earth you will see that this behaves like a lens just like you have a lens a lens can bend light and make images 
So similarly, the galaxy cluster, which is in the foreground in front of that galaxy, it will act like a lens, a gravitational lens and make images of this galaxy, multiple images of that galaxy. And that is what we have observed. So you have a cluster in between, and these are the images of the galaxy, which is behind this cluster. So you see these lensed galaxies and they confirm general relativity. They can also turn out to be like this. So you have lensed galaxy. So you have a galaxy which is behind it form these arcs around it. It's called gravitational lensing. So Einstein relativity therefore has been confirmed. And this as a tool can also allow us to determine what is the mass of the center cluster. So the mass of the center cluster, which is inside, which is causing the bending, we can find that out. We can also look at these clusters so we can find that there is. How much how much bright these objects are? So there is some sort of a matter which is inside that which we call luminous matter. So we can find the mass of the luminous matter and we can find the mass which is required to form these images, these curved images. They do not agree. So there is an extra mass which is required to, in order to find these curves. And that is why we postulate that there should be some extra matter in there, which we call, which is not luminous, which is not emitting light. And that is what we call as dark matter. And we are presently, there are ongoing searches for dark matter. Incidentally, this lensing is the same phenomena of lensing of bending of light. It was used recently also to observe a black hole in the center of a galaxy which is named M87, Messier 87. You observed, people observed this image of a black hole. So you, a near a black hole, if you, have a, if you have light which is emitted from very near a black hole, black hole's gravity is so strong that it will bend light towards us, not only from the, from the front, but it will be lensed also from the behind. So you will see both back and the front. So this is what you essentially expect to see. And this was observed by the Event Horizon Telescope in M87. The mass of the black hole at the center is 6.5 billion times the mass of the sun. It, the, there is a accretion disk around it. The, the black hole is not just sitting there uh, quietly. It is eating up matter around it. It eats up 90 Earth mass per day. And the angular diameter, the size of this, object is around 42 micro arc second. So just for comparison, if you look at it uh, this way, so if we put sun over there, that is would be the out orbit of Pluto. So the relative dimension of this black hole is quite huge compared to our solar system itself. So Voyager 1 would be right at the outskirts. So we look out really far using our telescopes in order to understand what our universe really looks like and what how what are the various phenomena which is happening in the universe to understand it. And we, when we look out, we can map each galaxy in the sky. So here's a map which was made by the Sloan Digital Sky Set. Each point here is represents a galaxy. So there's the millions of galaxies which were mapped in the sky. So when we are looking far and far away, we are looking, I mean, outside, we are looking further and further away. So you see that the distribution of this galaxy is, looks almost even. It's almost a uniform distribution of this web. It's a web-like pattern, and it has a very uniform character to it on very large scales. If you look at it for whether you keep place a very big box, a uh, sufficient length, which is around 100 megaparsec or so, you see that the distribution is fairly uniform. And that is where we really understand our universe at large scales is almost homogeneous and isotropic. That is, if you look in various directions, it looks the same. And if you go to another point in the in the universe, it will also, and when you look at different directions, it will look the same. So isotropy is the same in all directions. Homogeneity is if you change points, again, you will have the same, uh, uh, it will look same in all directions. Isotropy at every point is homogeneity. That is the uniformity by which, with which our universe looks. So 
And also this is encoded in something else which we observe in light, which is called the redshift. So when we look at light, which is coming to us, we know what are the processes that have created those that light in far away galaxy. We know how light is coming up in nearby galaxies in our Milky Way. There, there are these star, there are these regions, which is regions where uh, from where light is coming. We know what are the processes which are going on. The hydrogen atom is undergoing certain transitions, and we know the wavelength of those transitions. We, we clearly understand the processes, and we are getting light from a far away galaxy. The processes must be universal. They must be the same. Of course, again, this is another assumption. We extrapolate, that is, we demand that our electromagnetic processes, which have led to the, you know, the atomic processes, whatever is happening here is also possibly happening at the, at the far away galaxy. Of course, science always requires that we test all these assumptions which we make. So we do test all these assumptions. We find out whether the these processes are really the same or the, 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 there's a number called defined structure constant. How does it really vary or does it remain the same? Since it remains the same, almost it remains the same, the process is happening, the same process is happening there. So we should have gotten the same wavelength. So if the hydrogen atom makes a transition here, we observe a particular wavelength, let's say 656 nanometer, and we are getting a light from a different galaxy, which is far away, but it instead of being 656 nanometer it is much longer so there is since it is longer than 656 nanometer what has happened is as it has come from far away the wavelength stretches the light undergoes a stretching this is what we and one can find what is the wavelength which we observe so we observe a, let's say we observe a wavelength of 900 uh, nanometers so we can subtract 900 from 656 or 600. The change in the wavelength is 300 nanometers. So that tells you that the, the light has undergone a redshift. What could be the reason for the, and this is what we observe. This is actual observation, which we, something which you see. In order to explain this observation, the only plausible fact is that our universe is expanding. The expansion of the universe is what drives the wavelengths to stretch out. Okay. And that really pushes forward what our, so the farther and farther we are looking, the more and more high red, the redshift which we will see. So if we see something nearby, that would, the wavelength would not have changed much. If you go far and far away, the wavelength will change further and further. It will go stretch further and further. So we can map, therefore, our universe, the distances, our far, the farther we see, the, the more variation in the wavelength which we see, the farther we are looking back in time. The red, so we can map the redshift of light, how the wavelength has changed to how far we are looking at. And this is the picture which we have come to realize of our universe today. That is, by looking at it, we're looking backward in time. We are over here today. We see all these galaxies in our universe. The galaxies, if we look back, we see that there was a point when these galaxies were forming. The first galaxies, early galaxies would have formed. And then there would be a point when the first stars would have formed. And then there is a point where actually we see a certain radiation, which we call the cosmic microwave background radiation, the CMB. So let me just take a small while to explain what this is. Two people, Penzias and Wilson, 1963, they had their radio antennas, they were working on something. They saw that no matter where they looked at, they pointed their radio antenna. It's the radio antenna is like a radio telescope, right? So they pointed at one part of the sky and they pointed it at another part of the sky, different parts of the sky. They saw that they were hearing a sort of a buzz which was coming up. So that buzz was, and that was that buzz was the same no matter where they looked at. Okay. So they start, they first thought there was some issue with their instrument. So they went around, looked at the instrument. There were no, they, they, uh, they cleared up all the issues which they could find. 
and still no matter where they looked in the sky they could hear this buzz which was there the buzz which they could hear they then so set out to find what exactly could be the source of this buzz so they found that they got a nobel prize for it they found that the radiation the the buzz is actually which is coming from has a has a particular characteristic it is light it is it is light in microwave range it's in a microwave millimeter range it's around 2 millimeters and it has a temperature of 2.7 kelvin it's a very cold uh, radiation which is coming up and it is coming almost same in equal all direction so it looks almost it looks almost same in what direction you want to see except for these small points spots which are there but it's, if you look at it close i mean not too close enough it's the same in all directions this is actually the first light which we are getting from in our universe so let's go back to this picture again and find out what was what's going on again remember let's go back to that uh, thing we discussed some time back light scatters around it, it talks so that if you have electrons and protons as a gas light is always talking with those so it's scattering around bouncing back and forth this and that it is not really free if light becomes free in, so inside the sun there is an atmosphere it is not really free it is only when it becomes free it escapes the atmosphere and comes to earth the same thing is happening over here if you go to the early universe we can look at this particular microwave radiation which we are getting we see we want to see what are the processes which created this micro, my, this microwave radiation early in our universe if the light was this there's, there's a hydrogen atom there's an electron and then there's a photon the photon will hit this hydrogen atom and knock the electron out and then this electron will recombine with this proton and again emit light so this process this bouncing back takes place again and again and again so light is not really free to go anywhere else so it is bouncing up and down again and again except and then but the universe is expanding and also because of this scattering it tired it gets tired it loses energy and also the expansion when it expand the universe expand it cools down it loses energy it loses energy so much that it cannot really go and hit that electron in the atom and set it free so therefore then the then the photons really become free of those bouncings and they can freely come to us and that is the surface here this line over here from where we are getting this cosmic microwave background the photons are coming to us without any botheration of any sort they are free to come to us freely streaming to us from this particular surface so that is how we understand what are the processes which are happening we cannot see inside back because the again why we cannot see inside the sun we cannot see inside the sun too much because inside they are all not free they are really scattering around and this, this it's like a fog right if you are suppose you have a fog you are looking through a fog you cannot see through fog because light scatters around bounces around a lot it is only when light is free to come to you the thing is transparent that you can able you will be able to see that particular through it through a certain thing so universe from here to here is transparent and we can see the universe but when we come here we cannot see behind this we can only see this last photons which is called the last scattering surface what is happening behind we cannot really see but by knowing what processes cause this to happen we can really know more about what was really happening behind the scenes the light was really tightly coupled to those electrons and protons and if we go back what really made these nuclei there is a time when it comes the first nuclei form it is the first 3 minutes we, because we know about the nuclear reactions we know how the nuclei were formed at this particular time and we can trace our origins back 
Now we need to see more. We need to see behind the screen in order to find out what really is happening at the very early stage of our universe. That would be the starting point of our universe. But we do have some hints, even though we don't see them. The hints actually come from these small dots. Okay. So these, if the universe was completely uniform, if you did not have any any of these dots, you would not really form the large scale, the galaxies and so forth. Each of these dots combined, they were like they combined to form what we see the galaxies today. So you had the universe, which was like a fog early on. You cannot see through it and suddenly the light gets uh, free. And that is what you see this light, which is coming from this surface and all the protons and neutrons, which are here, the molecules, they can now collapse under their gravity and form the first stars and the galaxies. And so you form galaxies. Incidentally, you can actually see uh, Galaxies are formed, the kind of how these galaxies are formed is very similar to what you see patterns in a swimming pool. We'll come to that. So you see these, uh, if you look down a swimming pool or a shallow, uh, shallow body of water, like a river or something, you see these patterns there, right? So you see light and dark patterns. The light and dark patterns are formed when light gets focused. So when light is focused, it will form a bright spot. And when light is defocused, it will form these dark spots. The galaxies were actually formed by this very same process in our universe. You will you had matter collapsing at certain points, which formed these galaxies, and certain points where the the which we call as where the dark spots are are voids where there's not much matter. So you form this cosmic web structure which we saw earlier. Okay. Yeah. So these are very much like the patterns which you see if you look down a swimming pool. So the physics, as I am saying, is the same. What about the beginnings of our universe? That we have a, a fairly good understanding about what really was happening near the early universe. Again, you look at this particular cosmic microwave background radiation, you see these small spots. These small spots are one in a million. So the variation is one in a million. So you, the amount of variation they have, you see here, it must have been generated to some particular mechanism. And that mechanism is something which is responsible, which was really the case in the early universe when really these, these, uh, these small spots, how these small spots formed. And there we need quantum mechanics because the universe was really small. The more and more we are going backward in time, the universe is getting smaller and smaller. And the more we are reaching smaller scales, we need quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics tells us that have a certain tendency not to be, X. so suppose you have a pendulum. If the pendulum, if you keep a pendulum, it's usually if you keep it very stable, it would be directly pointing down. It would be at a mean position. But quantum mechanics tells you that there will always be small fluctuations which would be happening near the mean position of the pendulum. And these small fluctuations are the ones which are responsible to give us those tiny spots in the otherwise uniform universe. The universe was completely uniform. There was nothing, no, it, no matter which direction you look, it's all the same. But tiny fluctuation, tiny perturbations will give you these spots. And each of these small, tiny perturbations are the ones which are responsible for what galaxies which we see today. But you are at a very good stage because there are things which we still do not understand about our universe. And particularly the things are 
the, how fast our universe is really expanding. We find out various numbers by looking at various how we can probe the universe. You can probe the universe through the cosmic microwave background. You can probe the universe by looking at various objects in the sky, the particular objects called quasars and supernovae. And we find this number, how fast our universe is really expanding. And we see that the uni when we find this particular number today, we are actually finding two different numbers, not one. We are finding a value of 67 and we are finding a value of 73 in the units of kilometer per second. That is the rate at which our universe is expanding and they do not really agree. So there is lots to still understand about how really our universe is undergoing an expansion. So we're not really completely there yet at understanding the complete universe. There's still lots of open questions. And that is where you come in as future uh, scientists to future researchers to probe these problems. Finally, there was something which I mentioned that light, we can also measure the light comes in two varieties. It has polarizations. We can use the polarization, another property of this polarization property of light to find out more about our universe. Particularly, there's a, we can find out that the universe also, the, for instance, our own galaxy, it also contains magnetic fields. The, mag, the magnetic fields can be probed. We can find out how our galaxy has these magnetic fields by looking at polarization. So particularly, let's say, if you look at a milk, the another galaxy, which is outside, this is a whirlpool galaxy. This is the map of magnetic field of that galaxy. So we can find out the magnetic field of our Milky Way by looking at certain stars, which are called pulsars. They're basically like lighthouses. They are sending light beams to us. When these light beams are coming to us, they have a certain polarization. They have a certain property. This polarization, when light comes to us, if there are magnetic field in between, this polarization rotates. It changes. By measuring how much it has changed, we can find what is the magnetic field in between us and that pulsar, the star which was emitting, and us. We are getting this light, so we can find out what is the magnetic field between. So we can therefore find what is the map of magnetic field by looking at various stars in the Milky Way. We can find how the magnetic field really vary in our Milky Way. So that is where the polarization of light comes in. And finally, we really looked at the optical uh, electromagnetic radiation, but I said there are different probes to understand our universe. Recently, another probe which has opened up is called gravity waves or gravitational waves. That is, if you have two black holes which are going around, gravitational waves are ripples on the surface of the space time. We can now measure these ripples on the surface of space time and talk about various systems, understand various systems. Like, for instance, if you have two black holes, they grow, go around and they merge. So they will give off gravitational waves. These gravitational waves can be measured and we can find out more about what is really happening in these black hole mergers. So last part of the lecture is gathering data. This is where I just want to point out how engineering is really important in all this uh, understanding that we are uh, gathering a lot of data around of our universe and how engineering is really used to gather this data. We have various telescopes which we design. We have telescopes, for instance, in optical, which look at light, which is visible light. We have telescopes which are radio telescopes. And as I mentioned, these are on Earth. And then we have telescopes which are looking in other wavelengths, which are in space. All of them require a certain degree of engineering to uh, perform, gather data, and do measurements. Now, here, here is where you can also come in. You can also get data about uh, and you can also take whenever you take you have a camera or something like that and you are taking a picture you're basically gathering data you're capturing photons which have come from those sources and when you are taking a picture you basically made a uh, gathered all the data about that particular source so you can also do that you can use uh, any camera which you have you can use even a smartphone camera okay just put it on a tripod open it up for a, so you take a picture for a long time because these objects are really faint. You have to collect the light for a long, long time. And then that gives you a data to play with so that you can find out what is the, how bright these objects are, how, where these objects lie and how they are moving. 
so you can use various uh, cameras that you might already have in your homes or lens or uh, or or your smartphone even to get the uh, get the get the images just like you saw various images that i showed in the, during the lecture i also took them using various cameras and the telescopes you can do do that but remember there's a particular thing that this, you saw that stars move or in four minutes, stars move by one degrees. So if you want to capture pinpoint stars, you cannot open your camera for longer than four minutes. Also, it depends on what lens you use. So, so the field of view which you have, it will tell you how much, how long can you open it. So there's a simple uh, way to find out, which is given by this formula, which is 500 divided by, let's say you have a lens, which is a 50 millimeter lens. Everyone knows about photography these days. So if you have a 50 millimeter lens and then there's a crop factor of 15, you can actually take a picture for six seconds and you will not see the stars move that much. So that will give you pinpoint stars. But in observations, we have to take long exposures. So we need to move our camera as the stars are moving, just like the stars are moving. So we need to track those objects in the sky. And that is where the engineering aspect comes in. How do we move things so that we cancel the effect of Earth's rotation in the sky? So we make various engineering devices. These are called equatorial mounts, which can track, which can rotate the camera. If, if they can take the telescope and move it across the sky so that we do not see the motion of the stars. The cameras are equally important. The kind of technology that has enabled us to really do astronomy is astonishing. Earlier, as I remarked, people used to use photographic plates to in order to get images of stars, just like Eddington had done to find out whether general relativity was really correct or not during that solar eclipse. But photographic plates have a certain sensitivity. Cameras these days are really powerful enough to actually measure faint objects in the sky. That is how we get faint galaxies really, which are really far, far away. The photons from those galaxies are really traveling long distances and you get one photon at a time or two photons or three photons. So they are faint objects. So the technology and engineering is something which has enabled us to gather astronomical data with the current cameras and not use the photographic plates of the past. So this is the way you combine all the technology together and you can get images like, like these. Our atmosphere, as I last mentioned, also is a hindrance to finding out because atmosphere changes, the atmosphere is dynamic. So lots of things change during the time. So you can use what is there again, another technology which can find out how the variations are happening in the atmosphere and cancel them in order to get pinpoint objects images of the stars in the sky finally i'll talk this something which we really have to fight those of us in living in the cities we hardly know about what objects are there in the sky how sky really looks there's a lot of light pollution we really need to fight that out figure out ways to minimize light pollution so that we can really observe things in the sky so it's an amalgamation of engineering basic sciences and, <clears throat> and mathematics that comes in together to understand what how our, how our universe really works. And of course, you can look at, there are various careers in astronomy. I've taken this poster from the website of Ayuka. You can also take a look at it. There are various things you can, if you do astronomy, what you what all you can really do. There, there are various things, you can check them out uh, at Ayuka's website. And finally, here's an activity which I would really like you to do. This is an image of Orion. Let's say so somebody asked me what how the, what is the what is Orion? Orion is a constellation which looks like this. So it's a group of stars like this. You can take pictures of Orion. Just take pictures with your cell phone, okay? Or if you have a camera, you can take a picture. You can resize that image to two megabytes. Send them to me by this email address, drsupreetsingh at gmail.com, with your name, which grade you are in, and you can write down which place you took it in. Make sure you find out what latitude you are at. You can make that contraption, which I mentioned earlier on, 
use. And you can find what is the latitude by looking at what angle Polaris is at. So you find what is the angle of Polaris at your place, you will know what your latitude is. So send in your pictures and I'll put them on my web page for everyone to see. Thanks to all. Great. Okay. Uh, thanks, Supreet, uh, for a wonderful lecture. Um, so now we can uh, open up for questions from the students. Uh, now there are many, many questions. Uh, some of them have already been discussed uh, by uh, Abhishek. So let me take up a few more questions. Uh, I'll see the questions that uh, that are there, and I will. I would then like uh, the corresponding students to ask the question. So let me start. Uh, with the question, there was a question from uh, Khyati Thakur. Um, okay. Is is Khyati Thakur here? Sir, I'm here. Ah, great. Okay. Hi, Khyati. Uh, could you ask your question, please? Uh, yes, sir. My question was: Is there a known force that ties all the gases that form the sun? Oh, it's the gravitational force. Yes, sir. I so see. You Thank you, sir. The, so you have, yeah, you have the gravitational force, which basically keeps it balanced. But then there is a pressure from inside due to fusion and heat, which makes it outward. So it keeps it keeps it stable. Gravity will pull things together and the pressure will uh, pull it apart. So that keeps things in balance. Yes, I see. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Great. Okay. Thanks, Kathy, uh, for the question. Okay. Now there is uh, another question uh, from uh, Aditya Khambete. Uh, uh, hi, Aditya. Uh, you can should be able to unmute. Hi, Aditya. Could you ask your question, please? Sir, is the reason that the sun hi, Aditya. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Is the visible region in the electromagnetic spectrum we consider visible is particular only for human species or there are other organisms also who can't see in our visible region, but uh, they can see some other wavelengths which are not in our visible region. So what we call the visible reason is uh, is particularly with respect to humans. Of course, there are uh, there can there are other species that would be seeing in the same region, and then there are species for whom uh, uh, they see in the uh, in different uh, electromagnetic spectrum, like bees, honeybees can see in uh, in the UV as well uh, or IR. But <clears throat> the the way we have defined the visible region is from 400 nanometer to 700 that is for us. Yep. Thank you. Great. Uh, good. So now let's move over to next question. Um, okay. There is a question from R Dhanya. So, yes. So I had asked two questions and one is it is said that universe expands and change in space so what does it expand into ah good so it is so the universe is heat space time so okay here first of all it is the space which is expanding now i'll give you an example suppose you take a balloon okay you put two dot or three dots on the balloon a, but make sure these dots always stay as points, okay? Because if you blow the balloon, now you blow up the balloon, the usually the dots will also move, but let's keep them as points. So the balloon is expanding, right? But here the balloon is in a room. So there is a three-dimensional space. The balloon itself is 2D, right? You just need two, two coordinates to specify a dot on the balloon. So here the balloon is expanding in three dimensions. But the universe itself is complete. So that is what we are talking about is 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 complete three dimensional space itself. So you don't need. But if suppose you had an ant, 
okay who was or you had animals who were completely two dimension let's say a bacteria who is on the balloon the balloon is expanding for the for the bacteria the third dimension the room does not really matter right so you the intense the balloon itself is complete so in this case also the three dimensional space which we have is complete we do not need another four dimensional space to put this three dimension thing in and have it expand it can expand on its own so universe is not expanding into anything it is just expanding on its own yes sir thank you great uh now um okay let's move on to next question okay there is one uh, uh, there are some questions on youtube as well so i'll read out one of them uh and then yeah there is a question from yuvraj panwar uh, on on youtube and the question is you know, what is the reason behind expansion of the universe expansion of the universe is solely driven by the initial condition so the gravitational so oh okay the so what are all the constituents in the universe that cause it to expand so we have in our so space is any gravitational field is sourced by some masses right so if you have a mass it will have a gravitational field so you take all the components in the universe combine all of them up the total mass and energy density in this particular case because this is relativistic domain the total mass energy density of the universe drives the gravitational dynamics of the universe which leads to an expansion great okay now there are uh, some questions uh, related to for example black holes i guess uh, students are interested in uh you know this gravitational wave thing that you discussed at some point that they come from emerging of black holes so some people some students have question about black holes so there is a question from uh ashutosh jha uh ashutosh are you around yes sir great uh, you can go ahead and ask your question okay sir sir uh, my question was that can we determine the mass of the black hole yes we can Uh, just like for instance so you observe the bending of light so how much light how much the bend it happens the by looking at how much it has bent you can find out what is the mass of the black hole okay sir, if you are, if you are looking at okay and also in the gravitational waves also in context you can also find the mass of the black hole uh, by uh, looking at how much gravitational wave it has Uh, how much signal we have received, and we can therefore find what would be the individual masses of the black holes during that event, and the final mass of the black hole, which would result out of the emergence. Sir, it will be uh, evaluated uh, correctly. Uh, means it can be uh, means that it can be uh, appropriate. Um. Yes, so there are different ways to compute it. That is what I'm telling you. So if you have a black hole, which from the outside of which, remember I showed you a M87 a image of the black hole in the M87 galaxy. Uh, you see the accretion. I mean, you see the light around it, and by looking at how much the light has been bent, you basically can find out because you this is the gravitational force which is bending light, right? And gravitational force is given by the mass of the black hole. so how much bending has happened depends on the mass of the black hole and that's how you can find the mass of the black hole there okay sir okay uh, okay uh, another uh, sort of related question about uh, black hole you know how do you observe black hole is from uh, mohit ingal uh, just now uh, hi mohit uh, are you around can you ask you can go ahead and ask your question sir my question is uh, that black hole observe all the type of things inside it so how we are able to capture the picture of the black hole yes so we are not really capturing the picture of the black hole that's why you saw that there was a shadow region in the between what we are actually looking at so this black hole is actually there's a lot of gas around this black hole which is going into the black hole itself so when it is going into the black hole it is accreting it it is also emitting radiation we are basically capturing light from outside the black hole 
the the outside region of the black hole, the accretion disk, we are basically looking at that. So they're not capturing the actual shadow region itself. Okay, sir. Thank you. Great. Uh, so I think we have uh, answered quite a few of the questions. Uh, so maybe let's take one more question. It's about you know the way you observe the thing that you have discussed about you know, how the different ways in which we observe the universe using telescopes and so on. So there is a question from uh, related on this thing from Ritwik Ganesh. Uh, hi Ritwik, uh, you could uh, unmute and then ask your question. Hi Ritwik. Uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hello, sir. Hello. Yes, yes. Right. Go ahead. Ask your question. So my question is, um, is there a possibility that we live in a black hole? Is there a possibility that we live in a black hole? Okay. That's uh, so think about it. So if so if uh, we were really living inside a black hole what would be so first of all we um, okay here's the thing we are really looking out um, uh, so we do have how what does the structure of black hole first of all looks like a black hole is always formed as a result of a gravitational collapse so suppose you have a star which has been burning for a long time and then it collapses because the burning has stopped the pressure which was balancing the gravitational attraction it is, is stopped is unable to do that and therefore the it will uh, collapse under its own gravity and then form a black hole so that is the that is how black holes really form so for a universe, we cannot really be inside a black hole because every black hole has to have a formation history. So you cannot form a black hole. So you don't you cannot have an outside and an inside like so. So you'll only so uh, otherwise the mass everything would have collapsed inside. So we, then we will we would not have seen this these galaxies and all that. Okay, and things are not collapsing to any common center. In a black hole, a black hole you have a center where things are collapsing to, right? So, so here it's not the, the case. So that is why we are not really inside a black hole. So things are not really collapsing at a particular point and there's no outward pressure or something. So that's the that's the difference between a black hole and, a, and all or our own universe. So we're not really inside. Plus, of course, we can devise various techniques. What if we were inside a black hole? What how would things look like? And we don't see the way it looks like if it, we were really inside a black hole. Thank you, sir. Okay, so yeah, I think we have uh, already taken quite a few of the questions, uh, but there are still many hands raised. Uh, so I guess in the sake of time, uh, what I'll do is to maybe take uh, one or two of these uh, raised hand things uh, for quick questions, and then we will uh, stop. Okay. Uh, so sure. let let me. Uh, let, let me take one question from Arpita. Uh, Arpita, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Arpita. Uh, you could unmute yourself and ask the question. So may I ask the question next? So yeah, I think like, the question yeah, somehow, I'm excited about that. Wait, wait. Let, let me, you know, let let me suggest. Oh, okay, so somehow Arpita is not being able to unmute. Uh, so I, I'll ask, let's say, Arun Kumar to go ahead and ask his question. Yeah, sir. Thank you very much, and have a very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sir, I wanted to know about the Fermi bubbles that forms below our galaxies. Fermi bubbles that form. Okay, I'm not really aware of uh, the Fermi bubbles, what exactly they are. So can you 
can you elaborate where did you come across this particular term yeah sir just a minute i was just reading an article and sir they it is like the mysterious structures that emerge from above and below the centers of our galaxies above okay it is it is like they have a um, they have a span a span of total length of uh, 50000 light years uh, something okay so is, as something related to gamma rays Sorry. and uh, rest of the galaxy's disk okay yes so yeah so i think i know what you are talking about so this again uh, it's a speculative uh, question there are certain regions from where we see excess of gamma rays which we have yet not found what is their source so um yes those are uh, here which they are you possibly terming them as fermi bubbles so yeah we unless we really identify what is the source and what is the physical phenomena uh, related to them we when i mean I, i personally have not come across what uh, what are the cause or what are the reasons for these fermi bubbles or what exactly they are uh, okay sir i have one more question can i go for it Let, let, let me okay. let me ask you know, another student to uh, you know, uh, it is just a small question can i ask please yeah go go ahead uh, can we use lasers to squeeze and cool down the lithium gas densities yes lasers can be used to cool stuff so uh, then although we can, we can make made made it invisible right in visible and uh, what's i'm not completely sure but yes you do use lasers to cool stuff and uh, there's a reason for it because light carries both energy and angular momentum so you can get uh, so you can cool stuff using lasers uh, so, so uh, after that the light will scatter the less light and can be made invisible i think right well light you anyway you don't see light you only see objects which it illuminates Yeah, yeah, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Have a great day. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. May maybe we'll just take one more question in the interest of time. Uh, and uh, uh, student, a request to student is to you know please uh, keep your questions related to the things that uh, that uh, professor has talked about. Okay. Uh, so let me uh, let 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 me take uh, another question uh, from uh, let's say uh, T Bhargav Sai. Good afternoon, Hi, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Raghav. I wanted to ask a question about black holes. Uh, I heard somewhere in an article that black holes not necessarily um, take in mass and objects, but it actually absorbs energy only. Is it true? Uh, no. So when you so again, if you have black holes, they are really um so you have a gas which is so suppose you have a black hole you have a neutron star which is orbiting around there a binary system the gas from the neutron star will actually go and enter the i mean it will go in the black hole it will accrete the uh, inside the black hole so the gas really goes inside i mean so this i mean you are accreting mass or energy whatever you call it but the speeds at which the accretion is happening is really relativistic so the difference between mass and energy sort of goes away in that sense so what happens to this energy sir is it deleted what, from the universe so, oh. ah so as so we there is no okay if we don't really know what okay here's the thing we do have a phenomena where where which the you see you you were must have seen known about uh, whenever you have these uh, accretion disks you will also have jets okay the black black holes have these jets where which the uh, the high energy electrons are ejected out and we see radio waves from them so the energy is not really going away it's just being based in this particular case of accretion it is getting converted to these jets but we do not have really high resolution uh, uh data 
to really know what exactly is happening near the event horizon that would be something uh, which we are really looking forward in the future but as far as the accretion distance is concerned outside the black hole it the ma matter gets eaten up and then it gets converted to these jets so okay, it's not sir. really getting lost as in, yeah okay sir i understand thank you for your time okay great uh, so like yeah we are already well beyond uh, our time and we have already taken a lot of questions uh, i'm pretty sure that uh, uh, supreet is also uh, that now a bit tired of uh, in giving such a long lecture yes. <laughs> uh, so now i guess we will uh, stop the session here uh, and then continue next time so in the next uh, season of uh, these talks okay uh, we will talk about you know uh, we will talk about uh, elementary particle physics we will talk about you know what happens uh, when you try to observe the world at uh, atomic scales and you know below that uh, at nuclear scales and uh, going going even beyond that you know the the world at these scales is uh, dominated by quantum mechanics okay uh, the rules of classical physics uh, you know they are, they have to be modified uh, and then quantum mechanics rules this world and so what we will do in these next uh, in, in in the next season of uh, this talk would would be to you know discuss how we discovered various uh, effects um, that are not discovered that, that are not uh, described by classical physics correctly and how theories need to be modified how did we you know by doing various experiments uh, we figured out uh, various things about the subatomic scales okay so what have we understood till now about subatomic world uh, and what are we still looking for uh, and how do we explore that okay what are the experiments that we do uh, how do we think about it okay and what are the questions that we still uh, are exploring about so these are things that we will discuss uh, in our uh, next uh, session uh, of these talks so with that uh, i would like to now thank first of all thank uh, you know professor supreet uh, a lot for a wonderful talk uh, and all the students uh, for listening and asking a lot of interesting questions as well uh, so with this uh, i i would like to now uh, end this uh, Okay, okay. Uh...